Many of us will be very fortunate never to have heard the term emolument attachment order. Yeah. Today, we find out what it is. Welcome to The Money Show. I'm Gerald, Mr. G. Mwandiambira, a certified financial planning professional and wealth manager. And as usual, in the studio today, we've got... Hey, I'm Winnie Kunene, the money lady. Coming up this week, we're discussing emolument attachment orders, commonly known as garnishy orders. In studio, we have two special guests, Natasha Lavita from BLV Attorneys, and we've also got Marisha Brits from Brits Attorneys. Welcome to The Money Welcome. Show, ladies. Thank, Thank you for having us. Difficult subject. Very difficult. <laughs> <laughs> Being stressful for a lot of consumers. Indeed. Yeah, Before we stressful. delve into this topic, can one of you maybe just explain to us what is a garnishy order? Well, a, a garnishy order is basically a money attachment. Um, it's inter interchangeable with an emolument attachment order. It's basically a term used for the same, same thing. In principle, it just means that it's a court order issued and then served by a sheriff or messenger of court, um, directing, directing your employer to make deductions from your salary um, towards settling or servicing a debt. So basically, Natasha, if you can just confirm, there, there isn't a difference between the Ganeshi order and this thing called emolument attachment order. I'm even biting my tongue <laughs> in just saying it. An emolument attachment order is against your salary. So a garnish you can get be also be against a third party's asset. So it doesn't oh. necessarily have to be against your employer. So I think okay. that's where a bit of a distinction comes in. Generally, when people are referring to a garnish, they are also referring to an emolument attachment order. Okay, okay. so for example, you're saying it can also be applicable to a third party a garnish. Yeah, explain Please that. explain. Does that mean that um, somebody can come get money from my spouse? I'll give you an example. Yeah. Let's say money is, you've got money in trust and the money hasn't been released yet. You could get an order from court to attach the monies in trust before it's paid out to the, oh, really? to the third party. So that's a third party. Correct. That's where and that's where the, the term garnishy comes in. Um, emolument attachment order is also going to be against a third party, which is your employer. Okay. Hmm. Now, in, in terms of how do creditors get these garnishy orders, I think this is where there's a lot of media attention. There's been a lot mm. of reports about garnishy orders being obtained illegally. The process, what, basically. In the process. Yeah. Well, how mm. is it a garnishy order Well, it's, it's obtained in, in two manners, usually. Um, the first one is where a debtor or consumer has actually given written consent to that garnishy order being pursued. Um, normally when they default, you know, in the first phase, um, normally the creditor will try and intimidate them or try and push for signature of a consent document. Alternatively, if you are in default of that certain account, the creditor can bring a court application um, to have the garnishy order issued. It basically stems from a civil judgment having been granted against you um, to secure a debt. There's an underlying debt owing, and then they obviously bring a court application. Um, that can be with or without your presence. Wait a second. I thought, Natasha, I think uh, you were here uh, previously. Mm. There, there was a mention, I, unless I'm making a mistake, you must correct me. Okay. There are some creditors who, who allow a client to, when you sign a loan application form, you are already, without even your knowledge, signing consent to be garnished in the event that you are not paying. Am I correct? That would is, that, is that legal? You know, you need to make sure that you understand the document that you're signing. Oh. Often you'll also be signing a consent to judgment. And in the consent to judgment, they would have sort of added on the garnishy, the consent to have your salary garnished. The consumers wow. need to be well aware of the documentation that they're signing. That's Highly likely is that uh, then the person who's selling the loan is not going to tell you that you, that's what you're really signing into, up front. Into the agreement um, in terms of section 57 and 50, 58 of the Magistrate Court Act, yeah. um, what happens is you apply for the loan, you, you get the credit facilities. As part of the annexures, there's normally automatically a consent to judgment, which will basically incorporate automatically a consent to an emolument attachment order. And that's sure. the problem. People don't read the fine print. Mm. People don't read the documents. Um, you know, if if they're in a situation where they need the credit or the finance or whatever they're it is, they're applied, that's the problem. They don't read the documents. Mm. Mm. Now, now uh, Marisha, um, mm. there are situations which I've come across where actually um, some people say they actually never even gave consent mm. and yet they have a garnishy order 
which has been applied on their salary. Mm -hmm. How does this work? Are you saying that if there is no consent, there can't be a garnishment, or is there a way around it? The creditor, if a consent has not been given, will deal with the, the, when a debtor has not signed um, separately. But if, if let's say, for instance, there was never any consent or permission give, given for that emolument um, attachment order or garnishment order to be placed, um, what will happen is your creditor will bring a formal court application um, stemming from the judgment to secure that garnishment. The problem currently, you know, we get a lot of complaints like this every single day um, where the creditors have forged signatures. Um, the problem is that if, mm -hmm. if, there's, if there's a consent attached to your application for a garnishment order, um, what will happen is there's not necessarily, it doesn't go through a magistrate mm -hmm. to scrutinize the documents this or to the process the order. It's being facilitated by court staff. Mm -hmm. So then you'll wow. find that well, we'll, we'll get to the criteria for how, what to check on a garnishment order to check the validity. But that's a problem. Sometimes you unfortunately do get situations where signatures are being forged. Now, yeah. Natasha, also what we also <coughs> often found is that, okay, yes, somebody has gotten indebted, and yes, mm -hmm. they do owe a debt, but sometimes these garnish orders actually reach a point where someone can't actually live, someone doesn't have enough money to go to work. Mm -hmm. Is there no limit as to how mm -hmm. much the garnish order can be? If the consumer finds themselves to be completely over indebted, um, they can make an application to court to have a look at their garnish orders. It's that's of, what will often happen is that the consumer won't just have one. Mm. They'll have mm. a number of garnishment mm. orders from different mm. creditors. Yeah. And you'll find that the, the consumer is paying a substantial amount of their salary to, or the employer is paying a substantial amount of their salary to all the different creditors. Yes. And they're completely over indebted. They can yeah. then make an application to court to vary the orders. How, how do you verify that a, a garnishment order is legitimate, that, that it is genuine, that that there are no false signatures. Mm. How, how, how do you identify that? You can go to court and you can get a copy. Anybody's got access to go to court and get a copy of their court file. You can go through the documentation and then when Marisha is referring to a forged signature, mm. you can find the so-called consent mm. and see that's not your signature on the bottom. Mm. Also often it's not the witnesses of people that you've mm. never mm. heard of in your, mm. in your life mm. that have so-called witnessed the document yeah. that you've signed. And what information is actually contained on the physical document itself? So that if I'm looking at a garnish order, what yeah, should I what look, do you out look out for? for? Mm. The first thing is you look at the, the proper court jurisdiction citation. It has to be formally issued by a court of of law, let's say for instance example Magistrate Court of Pretoria. Second most importantly it has to reflect a properly endorsed case number on that order. Um, also it has to be signed by the attorney acting on behalf of the creditor or the, the creditor themselves. Mm -hmm. um, it has to also reflect um, the particulars, the, the specific particulars of that data identity number, full name, surname. Mm -hmm. And then most importantly it has to have a valid court clock stamp recorded on that order. You'll find a lot of these orders don't even have a court stamp um, or even that can be forged. Um, hmm. So it's, it's, it's a bit of a, a problem. It seems like you're, you're all mentioning and alluding to the fact that there is quite a lot of um, uh, misrepresentation happening in terms hmm. of the court documentation itself. Hmm. So who polices the people who are supposed to be enforcing hmm. these garnish orders? Because if I can get a court stamp forged and forged I a mean, signature, more, uh, uh, yeah. how come we never read any stories of um, these attorneys, etc., being arrested? You can actually delve, if you delve into it, I don't think there's been any, as far as I know, there haven't been any arrests of attorneys. But if you delve into the topic, mm. you can see that there's quite a bit of literature on the fraud, on the, um, the you know, the false court mm. stamps. People have gone to the effort of, like, fabricating a court stamp. Wow. I think it's very wow. important for a consumer to be, sure. to play an active role. When they, when, you know, the, the a document, a garnishment order, a monument attachment order comes to their knowledge by, whether it be, you know, through the employer mm. who's accepted service or, you know, contact from the creditor, it's important to play an active role and to be involved in that mm. process, scrutinize the documents. You know what you owe. So you'll know what the outstanding or the indebtedness is. You go through the statement of account, check balances, check the interest rates being charged, check legal fees, be active. You can't just sit back and, and, and just pay and expect for the debt to go away. So the advice from our attorneys today is really that when you do receive these legal documents, yes, they may look very scary with very long Latin words and legal writing, mm -hmm. but due diligence, do check 
check out the document, even if it's from a certain court. It is your right as a citizen of South Africa to go and access the courts because they're all public records. Check that it's really been lodged in court and this thing has just not been sent to your employer to take your salary. We'll be right back after the break. Welcome back to The Money Show. I'm Gerald, Mr. Jim Wandiambira. I've got Winnie with me, and we've got two special guests, Natasha from BLV Attorneys and Marisha from Brits Attorneys. And we're discussing garnishing orders. And before the break, we're really just going through the technical side to say, when you do receive this mm -hmm. document documentation, just check that it's proper. Yes, you may be intimidated, but it is important to check it out. Now, how often is a garnishing order deducted? Can a garnishing order stipulate every week every month, quarterly, annually, how does it work? It depends on the stipulations of the court order, what the court directed, and obviously it would depend on how frequently you're being paid. If you draw a money, you know, a monthly salary, you'll have deductions every month. If you are drawing wages and getting paid per week, so whenever you receive money as an income or remuneration, deductions will be made until that debt has been settled. Yeah. Mr. G, it's also important to note that the money comes off your salary before it goes into mm -hmm. your pockets. So, so your employee is directed to deduct these monies mm. before you catch wind of it. Mm. Mm. So oh. is, is, this, is, this, is this not a violation of my constitutional rights, you know, because I am going to work for my family. And yes, <laughs> I, 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 I admit you may be in a situation where you've gotten into debt, but oh. shouldn't it be the prerogative of the debtor to arrange the payments? Why should the court actually resort to such things. You see, that's where the process um, becomes applicable in how the order was secured. That's why it's important to check that the correct procedure was followed. Um, in other words, you know, was a proper letter of demand submitted by registered mail? Did the data receive notification? Was the data advised on, you know, his or her consumer rights to possibly approach a, a debt counsellor mm -hmm. prior to the proceedings? Um, was summons properly issued? Mm -hmm. Was it served mm -hmm. by the sheriff? So there's procedures in place to follow. If, if a consumer feels that this order was unlawfully or incorrectly obtained, um, there is a forum via the Magistrate Court Act to approach the court and have that order, order either rescinded, mm. set aside or varied. Um, like you mentioned, you know, if it comes down to a matter of um, the debtor not being able to afford the instalments and it's going to affect his livelihood, that is a submission that can be made to court. Um, a financial assessment is, is done and it's submitted to court to prove to the court that, listen, this is my income, these are my expenditures, I've got dependents, I've got mm. a family. Um, having this garnishee order placed on my salary with or without my knowledge, um, or having an opportunity to defend myself, the problem is that it's going to affect me negatively. It's going to mm. impact my, you know, affect my livelihood. I'm not going to be able to service it. In that situation, the court will then possibly direct for amendment or a reduction of the instalment. Now, late last year, we had a prolonged postal strike, mm. and nobody received any registered mail. Am I correct in saying that nobody should be getting garnishy orders from the last <laughs> quarter of last year? Because <laughs> did he, did nobody yeah. got any registered mail, so there shouldn't be any flying garnishy orders at the beginning of 2015. You know, in fact, when we do, um, when we attend courts to do rescission applications, it's one of the grounds that we're raising. We're telling the magistrates that everybody's well aware of this postal strike mm. and that it's been very difficult to follow procedures. Mm. Our messengers will go to court when we work on the other side. Mm. Our messengers will go to court. Um, to the post office and they won't they aren't prepared to take um, they aren't prepared to take post and then to obviously send the letters of demand by registered post so 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 late last year nobody received college <laughs> order Unfortunately, I wish that was the case. <laughs> it's, it's a matter of when, um, in, with the, the case law obviously covering these letters and notices being sent by registered mail, um, one of the submissions, like Natasha has confirmed, you know, one of the arguments that we do raise very regularly at court mm -hmm. is to confirm that there's no proper track and trace. It's one thing to have a registered mail slip just attached to your letter of demand and, you know, submitting to court that, listen, this document was submitted in terms of Section 1 to 9 of the Credit mm -hmm. Act or whatever, it's applicable. But to prove that that consumer has actually received it because that's a very important document it setting is. out your rights. It, yeah. I mean, ask, I it explains how yeah. you can remedy that account prior it's going over to a legal phase. Wow. Because a lot of people do claim that they've never received any any mm. any letters mm. um, notifying them or whether if they have a complaint
complaint to where should they actually go, go. for recourse mm. because I find that with people who are in debt it is not easy to even they're even too scared to, to go open. to the HR department mm. it's to embarrassing. actually go and, and find out the information mm. and have to scrutinize as mm. you're saying it is completely mm. not practical for mm. them mm. And, and all they do is just to die inside and allow those salary mm. that salary deduction mm. to happen every oh. month now, but then on the other hand oh sorry Mr. G uh, recently we, we mm. heard that there was a research that 60% of all the Ganeshi orders that are issued are invalid um, where does that come from is it is it really true um, research has been done by the University of Pretoria via the Law okay. Clinic um, yes. and uh, specific garnishy task teams have also been appointed by the Credit Ombud uh -huh. to investigate because there's such a large number of complaints and this mm. whole system, because remember your garnishy orders and emolument attachment orders, they're basically a form of debt collection, a formal way of mm -hmm. debt collection. Mm -hmm. So um, they've been appointed to investigate in, in validity that, you know, so instances where the court didn't have initial jurisdiction to issue the garnishee mm. orders. Um, people have already placed debit orders you know, on record servicing their debt. On top of that, now they've got garnishee mm. orders, oh, so no. they're servicing it in double, double. installments. Mm. Sometimes they've already settled the debt, and still, sometimes the creditors can't be traced. They move around, mm. or you can't mm. contact them to, oh, to query goodness. the validity or where this amount, mm. and it just keeps on accruing. I mean, it's quite common, I've heard cases mm. where people have garnishee orders on companies that long closed it down. Exist. So, they still so, deducted. So, but mm. now money. the question is where is the yeah. money going? And yeah. you've also got cases where you've seen 239% interest mm. being charged. Is that proper? Is that that's, even fair? That's definitely not proper. Mm. Your interest that will be charged on your garnish or on the judgment debt will either be governed by your agreement you either would have confirmed a uh, percentage of interest in your actual in your initial agreement that you signed mm -hmm. or by court. Um, the court interest up until I think August, I think correct, was 15.5%. Was it's now being reduced to 9%. So, so 239% wow. is just Whoa. absolutely ridiculous. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So where do you go in a situation like that? You I can go to myself. court. You can make an application you can go to court. court. I can do it myself as an ordinary citizen. I mean, I don't know the law. Can I just go and approach the, the court, court just like that? It, yeah. Yeah. So, the clerks will guide you. Um, okay. If you want to make any applications to court in any, for any matter, yes. If it's in your own personal capacity, you can go to court and the clerks will give you the documentation required. Mm. Okay. The only risk with matters like this is that if they are opposed, um, you don't want to start, I almost feel it's a bit unfair to have a lay person or somebody who's not familiar with law versus an attorney yeah. that the creditors have appointed. Mm. And you've got to keep that in the back mm. of your mind. It becomes a complicated, especially with costs involved. Um, it's already an intimidating process. Mm. Um, and I think it's important for consumers also to remember the whole induplum rule, mm. you know, where interest can't be more, more than, than double more. Yes. than the amount of, and, and you see these interest rates and it's crazy. Um, and mm. also with the Credit Act having been implemented, a lot more focus has been put on this induplum rule where all your legal fees, collection fees, everything is being calculated together with interest. So they can't exceed the, the principal yes, capital amount. But if we don't know that, they can get away yeah. with it. Yeah. Yeah. Now, now what also often yeah. happens is that, mm. you know, when a person receives a garnish order, the first thing they'll do is panic or yes, next thing is exactly. they'll just want to get the debt out of the way. Mm. Yeah. And often many people will put in extra payments, borrow money to clear the debt. Mm. But the garnish order carries on. Mm. Now, is the the court does the court have sophisticated accounting records to check what no. what your balance is at a certain point because it is quite possible that if I got a garnish order I, I paid it off mm. but this thing in court is still running yeah. for whatever mm. term the court's not going to keep track of the balances on your once you've got the court file and you've got the emolument attachment order there aren't subsequent statements of account to show what's outstanding uh -huh. you can request the statement of account from the creditor mm. Uh -huh. And then from that, you'd be able to ascertain if the amounts have been paid up in full or if it's, as Marisha has referred mm -hmm. to, in duplum interest. I think it's a, it's a problem also in terms of employers not having, not all of them, you, you're looking at your small corporates, mm. you know, obviously big mm. companies, you've got your human resources mm. departments, etc. But it becomes a problem when, when you're dealing with smaller entities. It's, mm. it's just literally administrative staff, payroll, mm. administrators. They don't always know when to stop the deductions. They mm. are, you know, obliged in terms of the court just to continue with deductions. So they don't always know how to check validity. They don't know when to stop deductions. So it's important that when you, let's say like you've indicated, if you've raised the lump sum and you've settled that amount, be active, get a, 
a, a proper you know no balance statement get a paid up letter or alternatively you can approach the court to have a rescission order on the basis of you having settled it that court order can then be submitted to your human resources department or your employer to have it cancelled is a, is a way of of me as a, as a as a staff member because remember this thing is deducted on a monthly basis I don't keep track Mm. How do I keep the balance? How, how do I know how much I, I, I still have mm. to, to pay. pay in relation to the debit order, I mean the, 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 the salary mm. deduction mm. that's happening on my salary? So that it helps me then I can keep track mm. on when it is enough. So mm. I can, how do, can I actually go and, and approach my HR director yeah. and say, listen, yeah. I think I finished and how do you mm. get, get, Definitely, you know? that's what we discussed now. Mm. Now, you know, but it's very important to be, to be active in this process. Mm. Um, in terms of Section 65 of the Magistrate Courts Act, there's no obligation um, on your creditor to give you regular statements every month. So, w but if you request it upon demand and you're requesting it, then they have got, they've got an obligation mm. to issue that. I must that. go so straight to the creditor. Go to the creditor. Okay. You liaise with the creditor. Okay. Remember, your employer can also request that on your behalf. We know mm. of big entities, mm. big companies, mm. that is their job. That's what they it's do. It's probably a better idea to ask your employer who's deducting the money yeah. to request a statement from the third party because yeah. that way yeah. it's between the parties who are actually handling the mm. payment. Yeah. Whereas you tend to find... Um, they don't want, they to, don't want to talk to you yeah. if That's they've got a garnish with you. And, and to me, it, it speaks to <coughs> money management in terms of saying, if you are highly indebted, do not give up on yourself. Don't don't now yeah. be Speak out up. cold and, yeah. and say, look, I, I'm useless or, or have a low self-esteem. Mm. Still be in control of your finances. Even if you're undergoing a, a period of garnishy orders, still be in control in terms of knowing how much mm. you owe, how mm. much is left over, because yeah. that's part of managing your money in terms of being in control of your finances. But, but also just, you know, the minute you see that you're now overburdened, speak up as quickly as mm. possible so that you can get help. You don't have to wait up until they messy Ganeshi orders and they just completely mess your life. Now, now we've seen in the, in the media this class action or this case which you were talking about or referring to earlier, which is basically talking about, um, um, which is basically talking about these Ganeshi orders. What could be the outcome and how could it affect many consumers? Well, it basically forces, you know, if, if, if a judgment ruling is made, um, obviously it depends on what that ruling is. You know, it, it might change the process in securing these garnishy orders. It might change, you know, um, officials, certain officials being appointed in every court jurisdiction to properly facilitate these orders mm. because you can't rely on, on even judgment, default judgment orders just being processed by clock mm. and not having wanting to undermine everyone, you mm. know, or anyone. Mm. But at the end of the day, you know, um, it, it's an important thing you know you, yeah. you need to say that would depend you know the, the outcome but if the process can just be changed to to have it closely monitored at court whether the actual orders are being issued we need to to establish a proper process okay there. so the final word is that keep an eye in the media as to mm. what's going on with the case around garnishy orders it might impact on you we're discussing garnishy orders we'll be right back Welcome back to The Money Show. I'm Gerald, Mr. G. Mwandiabira. I've got Winnie with me in studio. And today we're discussing garnish orders with Natasha Lavita from BLV Attorneys and Marisha Brits from Brits Attorneys. Now, we've had quite an intense discussion mm -hmm. and we're probably going to pick up on our viewer questions next week because this indeed is a very important topic mm -hmm. to most South Africans. Please send your mails for questions to moneyshow at bdtv.co.za. Now before we close off, um, Natasha and Marisha, is there an ombudsman or a place where I can raise my problems with garnishes? The general governing body is definitely the NCR, the National Credit Regulator. Mm -hmm. um, then it's also important for debtors or consumers to know that if it's an attorney collect, co you know, collecting on the account or facilitating the garnishee, um, you've got your law societies. Um, if it is a financial institution who is your creditor, um, you can refer the matter to the uh, Debt Counselling uh, Council for Debt Collectors. Um, and then also lastly, you've got the credit ombud if your creditor does not, is, not, does not, is not a financial institution. Okay, that sounds confusing. <laughs> <laughs> now we've reached the end of our show. Um, we'll be picking up with garnishy orders next week. Winnie, um, how will you be helping some of our viewers um, this year? 
If they have gone issue orders, maybe. I, you know, it, it, it's exactly the same um, issue that we're still dealing with. We're trying to get people out of debt. And we, if you do have gun issue orders, please do contact us. And you can get hold of me at the dream at winigunene.co.za. Thank you very much, Natasha and Marisha. We'll be seeing you again next week and continuing our topic to take our viewer questions. Absolutely. From me, Gerald, Mr. Jim Wandiambira, and... And Winigunene, the money lady. Goodbye. Goodbye.